Let's take a look at writing chemical reactions by starting with an example. You can react solid magnesium with oxygen gas and you'll form solid magnesium oxide. If we were to write this out as a chemical equation, what we need to do is start out with our reactants and show them turning into our products. We always write the reactants, the things that are combining together on the left, and the products, the things that are made on the right, and we use an arrow to show the change, to show that the reactants are turning into the products. We do not use an equal sign when writing chemical reactions because the reactants are not the same thing as the products. There is a change happening. In this case, we would say magnesium, symbol Mg, plus oxygen. Now remember, oxygen is one of our diatomic elements. So we would write it as O2, and that turns into magnesium oxide. We remember that magnesium forms a plus two as an ion, and oxygen forms minus two as an ion. So magnesium oxide is simply written as MgO. That shows our reactants turning into our products. We can also include states or phases of matter in our balance equations, and we've seen these earlier this year. We would use an S for a solid, an L for a liquid, or G for a gas. We will also indicate if things are aqueous, which means they are dissolved in water. In this case, the magnesium is a solid, the oxygen is a gas, and the magnesium oxide is a solid. There we show the reactants turning into the products and we're including our phases of matter. But there's a big problem here. We have to consider the conservation of mass. Antoine Lavoisier said that we must begin and end with the same amount of material. In this reaction as we've written it, I've got one atom of magnesium on the left and one magnesium atom on the right, which is good. But I have two atoms of oxygen on the left and only one on the right. So we balance these reactions by putting coefficients in front. We do not change the subscripts. These subscripts come from the chemical symbols that we've been practicing all fall. We're not going to change the subscripts. We're only going to put coefficients in front. What we could say is, all right, if I have two oxygens on the left, let's make two magnesium oxides on the right, and that will balance out the oxygen. Unfortunately, that unbalances the magnesium. If I say two magnesiums on the left, then my magnesium will be balanced from the right. And so my overall balanced equation will tell me that two atoms of solid magnesium will combine with one molecule of oxygen gas to make two molecules, and actually the correct term would be formula units for an ionic compound, of magnesium oxide. So again, that's two atoms of solid magnesium will combine with one molecule of oxygen gas to produce two formula units of solid magnesium oxide. Notice that we don't use one as a coefficient. If there is no coefficient in front of something, like oxygen in this case, it's assumed that there's just one of those things. Everybody balances equations a little bit differently, but there are a few tips I've developed over the years that I would like to share with you. The first is that you can't forget your diatomic molecules. Just like the equation we just balanced, we have to remember that oxygen is a diatomic element, or else we'll never balance the equation correctly. Remember, your diatomic elements are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, hydrogen, and the seven. The next tip is that I will often consider polyatomic ions as an independent unit. So instead of separating out the elements, I'll try and balance the entire polyatomic ion. So here's an example. If I take some copper 2 nitrate and react it with potassium, you will make potassium nitrate and copper. When you balance it, you'll see that you have two nitrates over here. By putting a 2 in front of the potassium nitrate, that'll balance out the nitrates. And then we'll balance it out by putting a 2 in front of the potassium. And so you have a balanced equation like that. And I think that's much simpler than trying to balance out the nitrogens and the oxygens independently. Sometimes when I'm balancing equations, I'll think of water as hydrogen hydroxide, HOH. And this ties in with the previous tip, because if I think of water as hydrogen hydroxide, I can balance hydroxide as an independent unit. For example, I can take this phosphoric acid, H3PO4, and react it with sodium hydroxide. And when those two combine, you will make water and sodium phosphate. Now, if I think of the water as HOH, I can rewrite the equation like this and have water here. Now, as I go to balance it, I can see, all right, what's wrong? Well, I have three sodiums here, 
so I'm going to need to put a 3 here. But in doing so, that's going to create 3 hydroxides. Well, if I have 3 hydroxides, I'm going to need 3 hydroxides over here so I can put a 3 in front. And I end up with this balanced equation. Now please, please, please don't leave water as HOH. Water is H2O. When you do this tip, finish it up by writing water as H2O. But thinking of water or even writing water as HOH can help you balance some equations. When I balance equations, I always start with the most complicated looking molecule first. Like in the previous example, I started with that Na3PO4. That was like the biggest, ugliest molecule there. And if I can get that balanced, then the other bits tend to fall in place. For example, I can get some lead 2 nitrate and react it with lithium phosphate. And I'll produce lithium nitrate and lead 2 phosphate. Now this could be a bear to balance, but if you take a look here, this lead 2 phosphate is probably the most complicated molecule I have to deal with. Well, I need three leads. If I put a 3 in front of the lead 2 nitrate, that'll balance out the leads. And then I have two phosphates. If I put a 2 in front of the lithium phosphate, that'll balance that out. And then when you put the 3 and the 2 here, you'll see, okay, well now I have six lithiums and six nitrates. So you can finish it off by balancing with six. Now 3, 2, 6, 1 might take you a little while to get there. But by starting with the lead 2 phosphate first, I think the pieces did fall into place quite nicely. You'll also find that it's helpful to use fractions. And there'll come a time when using fractions will be really, really common in the course. For now, though, if we use fractions, let's finish off by clearing them. For example, C2H6 is a gas called ethane. And when you take ethane, you can burn it in oxygen. And the result of this combustion is to make carbon dioxide and water. To balance this, I'm going to start with the most complicated molecule. That's going to be the ethane here, C2H6. So I'm going to need two carbons, and that'll put a two here. And I'm going to have six hydrogens, so I need to put a three in front of the water. When you do that, however, you end up with a problem. If you put a two in front of the CO2, that gives you four oxygens. And if you put a 3 in front of the water, that gives you 3 oxygens. So you have a total of 7 oxygens on the product side. The only way to get 7 oxygens on the reactant side is to use a fraction, 3 and a half, or 7 over 2. What we're saying is that one molecule of ethane will combine with 3 and a half oxygen molecules to make 2 molecules of carbon dioxide and 3 molecules of water. That really doesn't make sense. You can't have 3 and a half oxygen molecules. What we can do now is clear the fraction, just multiply everything by 2. And when you do that, you get a statement that looks like this. 2, 7, 4, 6. And here's our balanced equation. I hope these tips are helpful. Remember your diatomic molecules. You can often think of polyatomic ions as independent units. Sometimes thinking or writing water as HOH is helpful. I always start with the most complicated molecule first. And at times I need to use fractions, but at this point of the year, let's clear the fractions when we're done.